Hey, everyone. Welcome to Capitalize on You, a series that Hope, Gary V, and I are hosting together. We are really excited about this. You know, oftentimes, especially with women, we have two taboo words money and power. And according to Gary V, if you cannot own the concept of money and power, you are not going to be successful. So we thought we're all going to come together. We have different perspectives, different points of views. You've got Hope Tates, who is a money manager, a money leader, knows how to make it, knows how to spend it, and knows how to be thoughtful about it. So no better expert than that. And Gary V, who is a serial entrepreneur, who has made it, who has lost it, who has made it, <laughs> um, and, and shares the best advice, the good, bad, and the ugly um, with, with all of us. Uh, for me, I am very involved in advancing women, making sure we know how to ask for it, not to be afraid, to know our value, to know our worth, and to go for it. Because we all know if you don't ask for it, you ain't going to get it. The worst thing that can happen is you're going to get a no. The best thing that can happen is you get the yes. So a little new format today, because I just think with Hope and Gary V, no better experts in the world, the best advice comes from people who have been there, done that, period, exclamation point. It ain't in a textbook. It's about what happens on the street, being a street fighter and uh, really having to negotiate for yourself. So I wanna ask both of you a question, which is what was that first job you had that really taught you the best life lessons about what you were looking for? Like, what was that moment where you had that job? And it could start at any age. It could have been, you know, you were sweeping the streets. It could be taking out the garbage. It could be being a, a waitress, a waiter, or whatever, server in a restaurant. What, what was that first job that really catapulted you uh, into where you are today? Hope. Oh. So my, the first one for me, Shelly, is pretty easy. Um, I was 15 years old and I wanted to own my own destiny. I didn't want my parents to dictate what I could and couldn't do. And I came up with the idea of setting up effectively a canteen at a tennis only club. Um, and I literally bought the inventory, set, set it up, made the product, sold it. So I had to actually balance the numbers, right? Understand the purchasing, make the sale and every day account for what my net profits were. And again, if I got stuck and I bought too much and, you know, and, and it was stuff that went, went bad. And then I looked at the margin on what I made. Like if I put up an urn of coffee, right. And how much I made on every pot. And it taught me to understand inventory. It taught me to understand margin. It taught me to understand how important it was to get, you know, money into my own pocket and how I could drive the destiny. And then, you know, learning how to market it, like telling everybody what I had set up and sort of advertising it. So I was a one man Oompa Loompa band and <laughs> that, that's what taught me, uh, the importance understanding it from top to bottom. And I didn't know a lot about finance at that point, um, but I, I knew that I had the drive, I could do it, I could do it on my own bicycle. Um, I had a backpack, you know, bringing the goods there. Um, and I learned about customer experience too. And well, you didn't have to account for gas because you weren't driving a car, you were riding your bike. So you didn't have to put that into your spreadsheet. I, I wasn't old. I wasn't old enough, Shelly. I didn't have a license. <laughs> there you go. Gary V, what about you? You know, listen, the only person I've ever really worked for is my dad. And, you know, if my dad was here right now, he would make a face because by the second day I was in that liquor store, I was over communicating to my father about the 97 things that I thought we could do better. Um, for me, it's a little bit of a different thing. I think, you know, and I really mean this, and I've said it for anybody who's been watching, and I'm glad she's got the hat. You know, what the framework of this show, you know, is, is around money. I, I, you know, I'm an incredibly basic money executor, and I do think there's incredible power in in simplicity, and I want to bring that energy here. I think hope is a far more 501, 601 class to my 101 class. Let me explain what I mean. I have basically been in a very binary, simplistic game of understanding supply and demand. I'm very good at that. It comes very natural to me. 
whether it's the craziness of sports cards right now that nobody could see, whether it was the attention on social networks. I've always been so darn good at it because I've always had good intuition of what consumers were gonna do, which gave me an advantage of where demand was gonna come. And if I could understand supply, I could make good decisions. Very similar with my money. I've just never spent more than I've had. Now, in a lot of ways that kept me conservative in a lot of ways where my money could have worked better for me and we can get into that. But you know, I learned truly on the streets of lemonade, you know, it snowed like hell here um, uh, two days ago in New York and my sister called me and she's like, I always think of you when it snows still to this day. She's like, because first you would pray to God that we wouldn't have school all day. You'd be nervous for the next day. Is it gonna melt? Is the, you know, what time is the storm? Because I'd figured out they could call off school. But then more importantly, everybody would go immediately into play mode and I would go into work mode. I would shovel snow 80% of the time in my youth. So for me, I learned, and this is why I am who I am. I learned from the market, not from a job. I learned ding dong, ding dong, ding dong, nose, I could handle nose, which is why I'm an entrepreneur, but I wanted to learn from nose, right? And that, you know, from a very early age, like an athlete or an entertainer, I was practicing my craft. So my learnings came from market dynamics more so than let's say a job. You know, I think the biggest thing I learned at my job is why I think I talk a lot about culture. My dad managed Shoppers Discount Liquors, which is what the name of the store was before I changed it to Wine Library, in a very Soviet way. The employees are your enemy, you know, don't trust anyone. It was a lot of fear and negativity and, and I would argue that my 14 to 18 year old career in that store probably made me who I am today as an operator in a lot of ways. I naturally had it, but I saw what didn't work about having that kind of thing and so I learned how to be a culture driven operator both from my natural DNA and the way I was parented by my mom and then by being visceral, to be frank, on the way my dad ran his store, I used to be mad at him. I'm much more understanding it's the culture he grew up in, so I don't judge him as much as I did as a kid. I learned a lot about what I didn't want to do the first five years of my job at my dad's store. I think that's amazing. The one thing that still keeps me up at night is I have no idea where my kids' Pokemon cards are. And when you talked about sports cards, I'm like, where the heck are the fucking Pokemon cards. Those first edition chat, they're, they're worth, I mean, oh, what's wait, going on in that world is nuts. Go ahead. Oh my God. Yeah, I Gary, I found them. I found them for you. They're coming your way. Interesting. But, but, oh but Shelly, Shelly, the key, I think both Gary and I are saying one other thing. We relied on ourselves, yes. actually. We relied on the desire to earn money, right? And then figured out the skills or what we could do or capitalize on, and this why this whole series is so important what we could do to capitalize on ourselves to, and Gary is so great about, you know, garage sales and, and, and getting out and ways to make money where you, everybody, you can do it. And we want to help you take control of your own financial destiny. Well, money, I money, I apologize, Shelly. Money is a, you know, and I'm just become infatuated with this word. I think one thing we're talking about as an undertone here for everybody who's listening is accountability. Yep. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, when people are like, well, this, that, I'm like, I can't stop thinking back to the point here. The amount, of, I'm reading all the comments right now, Pamela T, Amanda W, what's good, Leo. I just, and I'm not joking, every time we do the show, it's like the fifth time. I'm like, I wonder how good they are at saving. Because people blame everything. And then, you know, especially, and these are people that I, when I know somebody, I'm like, yeah, but you bought a BMW nine years before you probably should have because you needed to flex. And so you were spending $200 more a month on something you, like that's like, people are not very good at the relationship of not only, you know, Hope and I's story was about control. Right. You know, but as kids, we both, you know, I was listening to her, I'm like, oh, I get it. I didn't want anybody, I don't want anybody to have any control over me, period, end of story about anything. But then you take on accountability. People give up, people don't like accountability, so they give up control. But I think managing your money is a very, very interesting framework around this. Well, I think that one of the things you both are clearly identifying is you need to depend on you. The one thing you can control, the one thing you could be accountable for is your choices. 
and you know, living with intentionality. Um, we have an amazing guest that we are bringing on. Um, so I, I want to do that introduction. And it is such a perfect segue. Um, Arena Novoselsky, who is the chief executive officer of Career Builder. How do you build your career? Uh, one of the things that you know I have completely valued, and Gary, you said this, is the no's. The no's also lead to the yeses, you know, and so next. Next show, we'll talk about what no led to your best yes and how you okay. found yourself in that. But we are going to talk to Arena about um, how you find your value, your worth, and a career that is satisfying. I always say when you love what you do, it's called passion. When you don't, it's called stress. So with that, welcome, Arena, and hope I am going to turn it to you. Arena, we are, so, we are so delighted to have you. And... Before we begin and I go into questions, why don't you give the audience, listen, we are trying to elevate the audience. We're trying to help the audience. We're trying to help them build their careers. We're trying to help them build their 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 pocketbooks. Give a little bit of background on you. You are a remarkable woman. You have built your own career. Give us a little bit of background. That's so kind, Hope. Good to see you, Shelly. Good to meet Thanks. you. Gary, I have to tell you, I feel like we've been on parallel lives in some way. So um, it's funny when I was uh, meeting with the team for this podcast, they shared we're from uh, pretty similar cities in, in the USSR. And then it turns out we grew up in the town next door in New Jersey. Where, where are you from? Um, nobody knows this, so I never really share it, but it's from Old Bridge. Oh yeah, so close to Edison. That's amazing. I used to play your tennis team. Were you, um, were you, were you born in the Soviet Union or did you, were you born here? No, I was born in Kiev and we immigrated uh, as refugees, very similar in the, in the late 80s when I love they uh, allowed the opportunity. So. Well, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Um, Hope, to, to your point, um, a little bit about, you know, you I, I came in just as I think Shelly was saying, the difference between passion and stress. Um, and one of the reasons that you know, I'm at Career Builder is just, I have such passion for work and especially as an immigrant, um, one of the things that I really saw, both from my parents who were highly educated in the USSR, my dad was a, an engineer with a PhD, my mom was a chemist, very stereotypical Soviet jobs. Um, and when you come here, it's very difficult. How do you translate all your experience into you know, an American version resume? And so I watched the thousands and thousands of resumes that my parents would send out. And we came here during the recession in the late 80s. And so that was even more difficult. And I very quickly saw my dad take the PhD off his resume, the, the other masters off his resume to kind of allow himself to be picked up on some of these roles. And one of the things that really became clear to me over growing up with not a lot of money at all um, is that independence that you talked about, that accountability, that having that control over your own um, life and one of the things that really highlights to me is just over time and we're seeing it now with COVID is that work and having the ability to get a job is such an equalizer whether it's an economic equalizer it's a gender equalizer it's race and so one of the things that is just so exciting from a, a passion perspective at Career Builder is that we get to put people to work we get to empower employment and we work with all of the Fortune 500 and a lot of small and business uh, companies helping them figure out how do they change the face of their companies, making sure that they're hiring a diverse workforce, and then working with over 160 million Americans to help them match up finding the right passionate job for them. Uh, Arena, what you do is remarkable, and you know how much I care about diversity and inclusion and ESG, and, and you are helping companies uh, get meet, meet their goals. Our audience there are a lot of people who are either looking for a job, looking to transition uh, out of a job. What kind of advice do you give them with regard to salary, flexibility, you know, equity, and where they work? Like what, what's the good fits and benefits? What are the top advice you, you wanna give the audience? Yes, and so much they good need stuff. Jobs? Yeah, so much good stuff in what you, in what you said, Hope. And I, I would start with, I, I don't remember if it was you or Gary that said this, but early on, you, you mentioned how important you both really leveraged your skills in your career and really put your strengths forward. And the number one piece of advice that we would give candidates 
is really leading with your skill set. And what, what does that mean? And it's a little different than the traditional way that matching work has been done in the past. And we're really trying to help modernize that. And one of it is not asking the question of, have you done that job before? Have you had that specific experience? But asking, can you? And that is a skill set related mentality. And it's highlighting those skills because especially in this disruptive world of COVID, you may never have had that kind of role or you're trying to take a chance or as a company, you want to change the demographic of who you're constantly hiring into that role. And that requires having a little mental flexibility to really be asking what are other skills that you have that you've exhibited in very different in different roles. I'll give you a really easy example, flight attendants. We've clearly seen flight attendants really being pulled back from a, a demand perspective. And one of the things that our technology matches them based on a skill set is customer service reps, which is one of the fastest growing roles right now. And so none of them have had that specific experience, but most of them have that overlapping skill set. Marina, I want to ask you a question to you, but to also Hope and Gary which is, you know, today we talk about the best leaders, the best employees are empathetic and passionate. What is the best question you can ask to get at that? Because, you know, I hire for passion, train for skill, unless you're a doctor, lawyer, or an accountant. Can you say that again, Shelly? I really like that. I want to use that. <laughs> I hire again. for passion, I train for skill. Mm -hmm. But if you're not just looking at where you went to school and all that stuff that we all have clearly said, that doesn't necessarily translate into a, a great employee. What is the best question you have asked in an interview that has gotten you this soulful, passionate employee? And I'd love to hear how Gary Vee and Hope, you know, think about that too. So what, what a good question. I wish I wasn't going first. Uh, I'll tell you too. So empathy is is so hard. Also in an interview, you, you want to make sure that this person is relaxed a little bit so you can really start understanding the true self of them. And so I use two questions to try to understand that. One is I asked to tell them about, ask me to tell them about their childhood. I find the minute that you ask somebody to give you kind of their upbringing, first of all, they start smiling because they usually talk about something that's near and dear to them. And all of a sudden you see kind of the walls come down. Um, so that's been a, a good one. And then the second thing is I ask about, give me some examples of what you've done with your team. Um, and people go in different ways. They sometimes talk about a social setting. Sometimes they talk about a problem that they've overcome, but immediately you start to pick on up on where they see themselves within the team. Are they a team player? Um, do they mention a lot of the eyes? And so you start to get a little bit of insight into that. So I'm curious that. to see what you guys are going to say. I, I heard something great. You know, it's that when you say I, 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 and you have this huge team, someone said to this um, person once, well, if you're doing everything, you don't need the rest of the people on your team. <laughs> get rid of all of them. <laughs> Make them go away. Gary V, what's your favorite question? You know, I take a very interesting approach when I'm hiring. I, I actually go into every one of those with the thought of I need to give them context and, and make them under, like it, I feel like it's my responsibility. Even when it's a very junior role, I feel like it's my responsibility to do a couple things. One, I'm incredibly passionate to make them feel wildly safe so they tell me the truth. So that's important to me. Two, I'm incredibly candorous around who wins and doesn't win in my organization, mainly so that they can opt out. Like one of the things I've been talking a lot about lately is like, look, if you have a good sense that you're insecure, this is gonna be a really tough place for you to win because we think that insecurity really leads to the kind of behavior, we're, we're hypersensitive on culture. I don't know what else to say. Like it takes almost everybody that works for me a full year to calibrate because they think, because when they come from the outside, they think what was acceptable behavior, the, like the delta between acceptable behavior at Vayner and somewhere else is like literally the way you look at someone versus like, you know, like cattiness versus like mean, like there's a big delta. So. I try to get people to feel safe. You know, it's funny, Irina, I'm very, very, very big on childhood questions too. I like context from the beginning, um, but it's more about me trying to give them the clues to the organization because I don't, I think people fear, I'm trying to get people to fear this less, 
they fear the short term stay in their resume because they think it's a vulnerability somewhere else. And so I feel a huge sense of responsibility as the type of business owner that is willing to make a quick decision when somebody's not emotionally intelligent. And so I don't want to put that scarlet letter on their resume when they're only going to be here for six months. So I'm spending a lot of the time giving them the truth, making them feel safe, and then hopefully they'll give answers. So that's, we, I take that approach. You know, Gary, it, it's funny you said that because one of the things we're seeing with our clients is they're spending a lot more time interviewing for fit, which is essentially what you're saying. And they're, they're reversing it and they're trying to exactly like you're saying, figure out, are you not a fit or, or are you a fit pretty quickly before they even get to the, can you do the job? Yeah, I, I'll be honest with you, Arena. I, I don't even, I don't even spend a minute on can you do the job. I make the assumption that you can slash if you can't, we're gonna speed that up pretty quickly slash it's just secondary. And Arena, I completely agree. I mean, listen, I ask people to go to their happy place, you know, because to try to get a sense of what makes them comfortable. Because I think you have to like what you do, right? If you fear what you do and you don't like the people, that's where the fit is terrible. So I, I want to see the authenticity. I actually ask, you know, what was your worst experience at work and you know how did you handle it and how did you know your boss or your team handle it but i before i ask that question i actually tell them what mine was because they need to see me as authentic and caring and open to refl self reflection because this is all about working in a team it's you know i talk all the time about throwing the ladder down and pulling somebody up right I want somebody who wants to climb that ladder, but I, you know, it has to be a combination of the person at top throwing the ladder down. So I think you have to make yourself vulnerable a little bit in and empathetic, um, and talk even a little bit right now during COVID. Be honest. Kids are coming in on people's laps. It's not perfect. I've heard oh, it's babies happening. crying. Yeah. And it's happening. And the empathy and, and getting people not to say, oh, I'm so sorry that, you know, somebody walked in on the room. Let's put that aside, right? We have to be much more self-aware and, and, and open to other people's challenges. And we have to be vulnerable ourselves so that We're, they feel We also went from working at home to living at work. So it, it's changed everything. So. We also talk a lot about the human CEO and bring your human to work because we're all human. You know, we are so far from perfect. And I think our imperfections are our perfections. Um, but I, I think it's also amazing, you know, as we're talking about capitalize on you, you know, what's your best advice for knowing your value? You know, so many, you know, people, especially tuning in, you know, want to know, know their value and ask for their worth. Do you have advice on that? Yeah, there, there's two questions in there, Shelley, that I asked. One is knowing your value, and two, you're kind of saying, how do you negotiate for your value? Um, and on the knowing your value, sometimes it's as basic as writing it down. And what I mean by that is a lot of people spend a lot of time highlighting their weaknesses and the things they think they need to improve on. And I'm, I'm just such a big believer of capitalizing on your strengths. People, we talk about passion and when you like what you're doing and you have passion for your job, you end up being better at it. And so the things that you're usually better at are your strengths. How do you lean into that? How do you make sure that the role that you're going for capitalize on your strengths? And a lot of it starts with write it down. What are you good at? What do you like doing? And sometimes those aren't the same things. We, we sometimes are good at things that we don't really love doing. And so having uh, self-awareness to recognize that is step one. And then the second part of your question is how do you capitalize on your strengths? A lot of times is asking for it. And you know, I, I think, I don't remember if Hope said this or Gary on one of your earlier podcasts, but it, it resonated with me because I say this all the time, but you can't get something that you don't ask for. And so how do you lead with your strengths and whatever it is, the worst thing that can happen is you get told no, but in that no, you get so much knowledge. Cause you, you get, can well, ask, why you, not? You, you also have to calibrate that one, there's way too many people that are have over expectations. They just do, they're delusional. B, I worry when people think about, I, I would, I, Arena, you know how I think about it a little bit differently than knowledge? Because I, I'm stunned by how many people take one other human being's subjective opinion as gospel. I think of it as a data point. 
context. And depending on who's telling you that data well, point is also my, really my, my whole life is like judge the judger. Yes. Right? Like when I like when I was being judged for my entrepreneurship by teachers and parents who are not entrepreneurs, even at 13, 14, it didn't carry weight with me. I'm like, you don't understand the game I'm playing. One of the things that I'm very passionate about is just because your boss didn't think that you were worth, not worth another ten thousand dollars, that doesn't make it true. It makes it true in this circumstance, which, oh by the way, you have no idea of what's going on in the macro situation. They might think you're worth 40,000 more, are dying to give it to you, but they got a shitty situation brewing over here. But so many people take it as the truth. Mm -hmm. like, I think that's so critical, Gary, the, the power of mental no. And so much of what, you know, especially with COVID, we're spending a lot more time talking about mental health and what that means, but that positivity in your brain and really paying attention to who is saying no to you, who's giving you that negativity and either taking them out of your world or focusing on that positive. But uh, you know, for every, every person that says yes, there's hundreds of people that say no to you across your entire career. I'm sure Shelly and Hope, you guys have some, some good no stories as well, but. And okay. one last point, Irene, I apologize. The other thing that I wanna remind people is back and we brought it up already, accountability. Guess what, you get the no, most people, not most, that's not fair, a stunning amount of people decide what happens next is dwelling and poisoning. Go forward. And, yeah, it's like, quit. This goes back to savings. The amount of people right now that can't quit their job because they're spending their entire salary on materialistic or other variables, right? Like, savings gives you the options for when you get no, and you know, there's a lot of people in the comments like, Gary, I don't have any savings, I'm barely, I'm like, you get every money you're spending. Like people bought homes and have more, you could pay $500 less than rent, you could, you could. You know, people are not willing to, you know, Irina, you and I have a huge advantage. <laughs> of starting poor. <laughs> dirt, yes. True. I'm being serious, yeah, yeah. dirt. Yeah. Dirt mentality helps you. I have friends telling me they can't save anymore, I'm like, you're out of your mind. You're fancy. You're well, fancy. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a, a personal story that I don't think before I got in a job and moved out of my house. I don't think I've ever walked into a Starbucks. Meaning, I never ever would think of purchasing coffee outside or a restaurant. I mean, those things were just such a luxury that I didn't really afford myself until I was out of I the mean, house. I, and I swear to God, until I was 15 years old, this is true. No joke. Me, let me go a little. bit. Until I was, yeah, until I was 14, 15 years old, I swear to God, I thought Red Lobster was a premium restaurant. Me too, Gary. <laughs> I will, Tell them. I will share Tell them. Of, I remember for my 16th birthday, I so badly wanted for my sweet 16 to go to Red Lobster with my parents because I thought that was the most luxurious. And by the way, I still do. Love Red Lobster. But um, you have different but, context and this is perspective. And all of a sudden, when I'm eating in fucking per se and having a caviar and a fucking egg, I'm like, wait a minute. This, you know, you have perspective. But if you've only been eating caviar out of a fucking egg, you're like, I can't save. I, but you know what, to, to bring this back to, to people that are looking for jobs and negotiate, one of the things I will say is we don't see that pay being the number one reason people leave companies or jobs. Right, it's the engagement in the company. Do you like your boss? Do you like who you work with? Do you like your team? Do you feel included? Do you feel engaged? We're seeing a lot more of, even I just spoke to a Fortune 500 CEO and we were talking with him of how do we help him get tools within his company to engage his employees. And so pay is definitely one of the items, but we're seeing not fall in the top three. I think, hope you mentioned benefits. That is coming up much more and giving that flexibility, especially to working moms that we're just seeing exit the workforce in, in disproportionate ways. Flexibility, so, life stage accommodation, you know, understanding that we all are at different stages of life. And if we want to attract and retain our best talent, we need to accommodate around that too. And and by the way, all the benefits and the long-term benefits that actually can make you save for your future, right? And mm -hmm. and it's really important that people look at the whole package. How are you talking to people about looking at the whole package, where you're working, what the flexibility are, what the benefits, and how you actually save money? Gary, you know, our audience definitely is having a hard time. We want to help them 
think about how the opportunities they are could save and carve out money. Spending less is obviously one thing, but how do they other things they can do in the work environment to help them understand the opportunity to save, to put away money in a in a four hundred one k, etc. Arena, what ideas do you do? Well, tell I would people? Say, I would say from a roadmap perspective, I hope there's definitely some short term things that you can look at from whether it's cutting expenses or from short term finding opportunities to make more money. But really the way you change your trajectory is again, going back to the skills. One of the things that we, we even do on the careerbuilder.com site is you put in your skills, your job, your skills, and it tells you if you want to make more money, what other skills do you need to get that next role? And that, that really that self training, that self certification is really the evolution of where we're going. It's much less about a four year standard degree. It's less about paying for this higher education. It's figuring out what certifications do you need? What skills do you need to go from the job that you're in now to the next jump, whether it's five, $10,000 more, how do you arm yourself to be considered for that next role, whether it's in the existing company you're in or the next company. And it starts by knowing where are you on your skills? What are you missing? And where can you go? And there's so many free tools now. We sync to a lot of the free tools, but there's plenty out there as well that allow you to manage your own career and going back to that accountability line, control your own career. Well, it also goes back to the upskilling in the moment. You don't need the four year education. You know, it's what skill do you need now? And there's so many ways of accessing that. I mean, Gary, you speak th about this all the time. You know, it, it's not necessarily, you know, in the four year education, it's, it's in the moment and you can get access to what you, you, you want to get access to and what you feel you need. And, and we see that the majority of the candidates and when you think about the, the US population, the majority of the U.S. population does not have a standard four-year degree. That's really only about 30 percent. And so when, when we think about both our candidate universe and the majority of U.S. Americans, they're looking for other options, to your point, Shelley. So, I, Arena, I'm going to put you on I the also, spot. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Hope. I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. Why do you think that men have an easier time building wealth or getting that job than women? And how do we change that? Uh, I want to pivot that a little bit. Um, and, and here's how I think it starts right now. We know that there's an economic discrepancy that happens, that women get paid 82 cents on the dollar. So right there, you're starting with a little bit something that we as leaders, whether it's on this phone or anybody that is in a power of hiring, it's on us to change that dynamic and making sure that we're really driving wage parity. But that really translates into material dollars. It's uh, for an average American, that's 10,000 a year. That's almost half a million dollars over the course of a, a career. So that's one thing. The second thing is, again, going back to the skills and really understanding where are you trying to position yourself? So if you think about COVID, one of the things that we talk about is that women are disproportionately impacted by what's happening in COVID. And a lot of that is because women, there's a disproportionate amount of women in hospitality roles. So if you look at restaurant waiters, about 70% of restaurant support staff is women. And so when you think that restaurants are being the most impacted, it's driving a lot of that. And so that doesn't mean you should exit industries, but in a world that things are disrupting so quickly, how do you take your skill set and pivot quickly into another role and really leverage? There's so much technology, whether it's Kerbal or other tools, there's so much tools out there to get in there and understand with your skill set, what role could you be best suited for? And then I to say one thing, waiters in restaurants are also the best employees because they understand what we were talking, customer service. We They're sales. And, it's, and we talked about IQ. Winners, customer Pro service. Problem solving. In their DNA. I can't tell you. I, I, I had this one story. We were at a restaurant and I just thought this, this waitress that was serving us was just so thoughtful, high EQ, communicative. I asked her if she's looking for a sales job. Love I that. wanted this person on our team. And so. I mean, I've, I've done the same thing. I've like literally hired, like, it's, and by the way, spot. on the spot, Warby. Warby Jung, yes, I'm reading the comments during this talk. I'm, I'm listening on both sides because I use the context and the feedback of the audience and this conversation to give me thoughts of things that I could bring value to this combo or in the future. So that was to answer you. Keep going, ladies. No, I, Arena, I think you're so right. I love your story about the 
flight attendants, right? And customer service. Customer service is a huge opportunity. Upskilling, uh, you know, and pivoting is a great idea. Give us some other great ideas that we can help the audience to find better jobs and make more money and ultimately be in a position to save. Sorry, Gary. Irina, I w- actually, I want to add to it because something that I'd love to get your perspective on, Irina, that I've had a lot of intuition around and I've seen some people follow when I've thrown it out there and have high success. Irina, why or do, so I guess both, I feel like people limit their at-bats when looking for a new job. I am fascinated that it's 2021 and we have a world where a bunch of people can be in a community and make a shorted stock go up to $300 a share. We'll ask Hope about that in another episode. I don't think people know how to use technology. I'm not saying that you should spray and pray and run, and run an algorithm of machine learning AI and spam every business. But in the, today's world, it just feels like you can send 31 resumes instead of two. And I feel like, is there a subconscious massive fear of getting 31 no's? Like so many people who've heard me talk about this and I don't talk about it a lot, but I get so many emails to this day of videos from a year, two, three, four, five years ago. And they were like, Gary Vee, I was struggling for nine months because I was unhappy. I saw you in an interview, you said this. And God damn it, I did send 100 resumes and I got my job. Like, there's, I'm a little bit concerned about people not giving themselves more at bats. It's just, it's not like the old days when you had to knock and go and fine, I could, you had kids at home. I get it. Now it's literally right here. Is there something there, I mean, Like, can we get people? I mean, you're literally more? hitting the nail on the head, Gary. And, Thank and you. I will, I'll share from <laughs> both sides. And it's, it's a dynamic that's Good. changing. So, what you're seeing is actually the evolution of uh, an approach. So from an employer perspective and from a candidate perspective, technology has massively changed. I I will tell you the career builder matching engine. And if you think about it, it's literally on match.com where we take everything that we know about you as a candidate, everything that the employer is looking for. And then we have a percentage match. It's the Netflix, you're most recommended to watch this movie kind of match, right? And so the thing that we do is, and this is the technology at work, exactly what you were saying, is we'll look at your background, we'll look at your skill set, we'll look actually at the one or two jobs that you apply, and then we will give you recommendations of another 25 that have over a 95% match, and with one button, you can literally apply to all of them. And on the other side, we're doing the same matching for companies, because they're saying, I love Gary, go get me 10 more Gary's. And we literally take Gary's background, put it into our our search engine, maybe 10 is too many, but a few more (laughs) um, Gary's. And you you literally put it in the search engine and then we get a Hope, we get a Shelly that literally gets recommended for them. And that technology, it's, it's early. We are early on that technology curve. And one of the things that we're seeing with our successful clients is they're embracing it. And those that are, are watching, they're missing out on, on some good talent and efficiencies in their org. And Irina, I just want to say, because the bias barriers and with implicit bias, especially in resumes and matching and AI and algorithms and all of that, you know, if you put mom on your resume or PTA, it typically is a ding. But if we can create the right data sources of the skills that the waiters you know, have, and I'm saying waiter, waitress, flight attendant, mom, a mom can multitask on steroids, has empathy, um, is the CEO of a household, uh, you know, all the skills. We need to also bring that in to the algorithms that we're creating, where we are not making being a mom a, a barrier, but actually an opportunity of an amazing, you know, employee, you know, on the team. Definitely. And on the other side, one of the things that candidates really watch is the job description. You'll be surprised Mm -hmm. we've done, we do a lot of testing where we'll put two of the same job descriptions and just change a few words and which one will candidates click on. And the words that are used by companies to describe their job is one of the most important keys for getting a candidate to click on your job or not. And so one of the things that we provide our recruiters is we give them insight on which words are not really gender neutral, that are discriminatory. And it could be words that we use every day. I don't associate with this particular word. I don't think Shelly or Hope will either with this comment, but rock star in many cases dissuades women from applying. 
clearly not for this audience. I think everybody in this audience. Aggressive, assertive, directive. You know, those are all words that are a little off-putting because we yeah. don't see ourselves that way versus empathetic, collaborative, compassionate, nurturing, team builder. You know? Exactly. And so to your point, it, it's not only just capturing that experience, but making sure we're using the right words. Or another thing that we're seeing, and, and you guys mentioned this earlier, is there's gaps in people's resumes. And especially yeah. now with COVID, how do you really pull the skills from that gap? Whether you were taking care of an elderly family member, there's skills in that that you can highlight to, to show that during those months, you had to do a lot of logistics, communication, your empathy, your patience. Those are things that are necessary for every job. Arena, what you are doing at Career Builder and, and getting people to match match perfectly and and employed and giving them hope um you know so honorable we love to ask on this show what is your advice to your younger self what would you, Irina, what would I, you I, have been i apologize before you answer that question i just want to say goodbye to the audience because i have to run to a hard stop but ladies take it away and everybody in my community on my channel is watching this keep watching this brilliance and irene i hope we get to meet in person i love the shared background you too gary <laughs> i shall Thanks, hope gary. Love you guys. so arena because we're always tight on time what's the advice what's the advice you'd give your younger self what's your advice you'd give this audience that they can be, you, you have a remarkable career. You've been a woman in a man's world. You have do, done so much. We all take our hats off to you. What's your advice to your younger self? Um, I hope I get to hear yours, Hope, too. But one of the things I would say, and we talked about this, is uh, tune out the negativity. Uh, we, you know, we spend so much time processing the negativity we hear, the no, and just tune it out and really continue to stay focused on the positive and just reaffirming to yourself you can do it and keep moving forward and just not let any of that negativeness get in. From, from a candidate perspective, what I would tell all the people out there looking for the right job, whether it's they have a job or they're not, it's the same thing, keep going. You will find it, it is out there, and a lot of times you just have to push through the no, through the not today, and just continuing to, to show up and, and keep batting. So, Arena, I think that's unbelievably great advice. I agree. It's play for the long game. Don't be afraid. You know, you might fall, get up, you know, pivot, keep going. Um, and also keep using your network. You know, we say, and we've do we're doing this podcast, reach out, keep lifelong learning about opportunities. You know, g go to sites like Career Builder do so that you can have a better future. Um, and again, I say, reach out to me. We'll, we're all here to help. We're all here to make a difference. And we love, the three of us love being around strong women. Um, and by the way, my advice to my younger self. Yeah, I want to hear really, it. I, I never thought of myself as a girl versus a boy. Um, and Do you know something think, so funny, Hope? Neither did I. I just did not associate with gender until others put that on me. I just thought forward. So... Let's tell I'm think curious forward, what's think yours? The, or together. Uh, I, I think for me, it's um, I it, it's realize your differences are your greatest strength and don't let others define you. You need to define yourself because that's where authenticity is. You can fake it once or twice and try to be someone else, but you can't consistently be someone else. You have to be you and be proud and believe in yourself. And if you believe in yourself, others will. So I think that's the truth. So this has been wonderful. You are, Arena, you are such a role model to so many uh, people. I'm not going to say women. You're a role model to so many people. Um, we love having you on. Uh, you've pulled up so many. And let's hope we can keep doing that on this show and keep building everybody's hope for a better future. I love that. And I so. really love what both you and Shelly are doing. Keep doing it. And thank you for including me today. You're awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Bye.